Parasites in Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam and I am really honored to share this groundbreaking, huge discovery. I would believe that it's the greatest discovery into the cause of multiple sclerosis. And so I'm going to share with you three different huge pieces of discovery from a very well-respected pathologist in the United States. And I'm going to break it down at, into really the relevance for those of us that are suffering with MS. And, and it's really important. It helps us to understand in order to recover, what do we have to, how do we have to treat? What do we have to focus on? So this Dr. Alan McDonald found Filarial worms, which are very small, immature, round tapeworms. So they're roundworms, sorry, not tapeworms, roundworms. So he first found those. And then he also found Borrelia in the central. So this is in the central nervous system of MS patients. And he also found immature developing tapeworms in the central nervous system of MS patients. So we're going to talk about all three of these findings that he's had. And this is literally just within the last four to five years. So I'm going to, I've got a couple of slides I'd like to share with you. So I'll head over there. And as I'm sharing this with you, if it really helps you to understand like what you're dealing with, and if you're super excited to know that my goodness, there is a cause of this horrible disease I'm living with. So that means there could be a cure and there is if you treat the parasites. Please like and share this with others so that we can help. You can help us get the word out so that we can help to bring change to the way that we treat multiple sclerosis, but also other conditions. And the reason that I am doing this work is that I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis over 30 years ago. And I was very, very fortunate. I believe it's by the grace of God that I discovered early on that the MS was caused by infections. And I discovered that through the work of several medical doctors. And what I did from there is I just, I decided to take a different path. And whether you have just been newly diagnosed or whether you've been sick for a long time with multiple sclerosis, in order to recover, we have to take a different path. And so I'm I have spent a lot of time this year sharing with you a lot of different research studies. And I would say that, you know, ending this year, this is truly what I'm sharing with you today, is the most profound discoveries into the cause of multiple sclerosis. So what is your part? I hope that you will take this research and you will share it with your neurologist, your general practitioner, your nurse practitioner, your chiropractor, share it with every single healthcare professional that you know. It's time we start to get people, these healthcare professionals, even knowing about it. And as we continue to give them more and more information, more evidence, then we actually will catch their interest. And not all of them will be interested, but definitely the really the ones that really, really care and really want to help us to find an answer. So this, I'm going to start with the first research. So I don't know what the year was, but this little poster was published by Dr. Alan McDonald in the year 2016. So whether it was 2016 or 2015, but there was a gentleman 80 years old and he had multiple sclerosis and he died and his family wanted to know if he had Borrelia, which is the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And Dr. Alan McDonald, that is his expertise is, is Lyme disease in the central nervous system and how that is that bacteria could possibly be linked in with um, Alzheimer's and, and other chronic diseases also. So he did look at, so he was able to get the the, from the autopsy from this gentleman who was a clinically diagnosed case of multiple sclerosis and he died. He was able to examine the brain and the spinal fluid of this gen of this gentleman. And he found that while well, he was looking for Borrelia, right? And so um, I have shared, and I just want to stop for a minute. I've shared a separate video about multiple sclerosis and filarial worms. So there, that will go into a lot more detail. It'll show all the pictures from his lecture, etc. But I'm just going to talk in general sense right now. So this little poster that he has created here, Dr. Alan McDonald, is really his findings in that gentleman that was 80 years old. 
and he found Borrelia, but he also found filarial worms. And filarial worms are very small roundworms. And these are like the immature forms that he found a lot of. So he found the zygote, which is like the developing kind of like baby. And he found eggs and he found the filarial worms. And he found them in abundance. So that was quite a shock because he wasn't looking for worms. And so from there, and let me just share a few things that he shared in this poster. And we're going to share all of this research with you so that you can share it with your practitioners. But let me backtrack. Why is this so significant for multiple sclerosis if you find these little worms in the central nervous system? Because at least at least over 100 years ago, and I believe it's 1880 is when the first research was coming out that when domestic animals have these small parasitic worms in their central nervous system, they have symptoms identical to multiple sclerosis. So they will have the extreme fatigue, they will have muscle weakness, they will have balance issues, they will have spasticity and paralysis and blindness and the list goes on. It is just shocking and it's so crazy that, you know, if the veterinarians knew this was true in animals, why would these researchers and vets and docs, doctors not make the link and think, gee, I wonder if people with neurological diseases could have these little worms in their central nervous system. So that is why this is so relevant. And in 1880, they already knew this, veterinarians already knew this, that when these small roundworms get into the central nervous system of domestic animals, that would be dogs, cats, horses, cattle, sheep, etc., they have symptoms identical to MS and other neurological diseases. So this study that Dr. Alan McDonald did, this like accidental find, this huge find, which he should honestly be getting awards for, for this and for the future research I'll be telling you about. So this study, the name of this uh, poster, you might be able to find it online, but we will post it here. I think we should put all of this together like on one page on our Live Disease Free uh, website, livediseasefree.com. I do have a lot of research there and you can look in the main menu on livediseasefree.com and there is separate studies for fungal, uh, fungal infections with multiple sclerosis and also the Lyme infections, but also these par different types of parasites. So this study is uh, nematode filarial worms in cerebrospinal fluid of an MS patient at autopsy. And so he shared that the larva, larval nematode worms, so he was not able to just distinguish really well from this one case, whether they were, you know, the immature forms or there were adult forms present, but he found that there probably were more than one type of worm so with filarial worms, there can be many cousins, like their species. And so he said it's very possible that there's more than one type of these roundworms present. And that really goes back to what we talk about and the research that's really coming out is that multiple sclerosis is really a state of dysbiosis. We're out of balance. We have multiple, multiple different types of microbes that are making us sick. So he says that there could be more than one type of these little roundworms. And he said that the nematode filarial invasion of the brain tissue to produce areas of myelin destruction, so the destruction to the myelin sheath, which typifies the clinical and pathological signature. So that really is the signature of multiple sclerosis. We have damage to our myelin, right? And so he proposes that these little worms, that they're moving around in our central nervous system and they can cause a cascade of problems, whether it's their eggs, whether it's the debris that they leave behind, whether it's the bacteria that they're, that live in them. And if you go back and watch my other video about MS and filarial worms, you'll see that he also found that these worms are infected with Borrelia. So that was the second microbe. So he used the fluorescent uh, green dye, which is attracted to the DNA of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, and these worms just lit up with the green dye. So they are infested with Borrelia. So they're literally carrying Lyme disease into our central nervous system. 
So whether it's the worms directly causing the damage, whether it's their debris, their waste material, and also they have an exoskeleton, which is like a cuticle, and that can break down and that can be in our spinal fluid. So our immune system is gonna to react to all of this. It's all foreign, it is all the invader. And also the, and he just tested for Borrelia, but what if these worms carry other microbes? So we know that some of these filarial worms, they carry a certain bacteria that causes a very strong immune reaction when, uh, if you look at other filarial, filarial worm infections. So there could be other bacteria or other small parasites that these worms carry. And it's interesting that we can become infected with these filarial worms, even from a mosquito bite. So it's not just from ticks. It's not just from, you know, whether we just get infected from on our produce or from other animals or from the dirt, but can also be from a mosquito bite sometimes mosquitoes carry the immature forms of these little filarial worms. They're tiny. And so he really believes that that from that one case study that he looked at, and again, just in this 80 year old man that died that had multiple sclerosis. So at the time of death, it showed that he had these filarial worms, he had parasites. And another interesting thing is that the Japanese uh, have so Japanese researchers they reported that nematodes can cause lesions in the central nervous system and that was back in 1939 so in 1939 they already knew that nematodes can cause lesions in the central nervous system and I've shared other videos of that they know very well that different types of infections parasites can cause lesions in the central nervous system and the I believe that these lesions are just pockets of infection where our immune system is trying to deal with the parasites that we're dealing with. And a parasite is any microbe that causes us harm. It could be fungus, it could be bacteria, it could be a worm, it could be a single cell protist like an amoeba or babesia, which is common in multiple sclerosis. So it's so fascinating that in 1939, they already knew. So that's the earliest research I found that they knew that these parasites can cause lesions in the central nervous system. So conclusion, multiple sclerosis in humankind is a uh, malacia lesion because of the tissue wandering behavior of the larval nematodes, which are the roundworms. The worm may have moved beyond the area of the lesion and to produce more trauma in a different area of the central nervous system. So that is the first, this is where it all started. Dr. McDonald was not looking for worms in MS patients. He was asked to look to see if there were, if that patient had Lyme disease, because there is a lot of interest in that possibly Lyme disease can cause multiple sclerosis because a lot of people that have Lyme disease, they have a lot of similar symptoms to people that have MS. And with our students in the Live Disease Free Academy, they definitely have a lot of symptoms. The vast majority of them have a lot of symptoms of the Lyme infections. And again, that would play, play just a single part role. It's not the only infection they're dealing with, but it definitely can be one of the major factors. Then Dr. Alan McDonald decided, it's like, well, if I could find these worms in one MS patient, then I wonder if how how common they are in other MS patients. And then of course the Borrelia also, because that is his interest of study. So he went back to this brain bank. So it is a uh, brain bank where they collect the autopsies of people that have died. And so they have clinically confirmed diagnoses of MS people that died and had a, a case or they were had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So he looked at 10 samples and in every single brain, especially the, the spinal fluid, in every single case, he found many, many of these filarial worms. Like it wasn't in one out of 10 or two out of 10. It was in every single case. And so that was incredible. And he has a video lecture on Vimeo. And if you can't find it, you can go to livediseasefree.com under research, under parasites, and there's a direct link to Vimeo there. And you can actually look at the, his lecture and he talks about this. So this was, uh, at least, I think it was around still 2016. So it's not that old yet. But with these discoveries, you would think that this would just explode in the MS community. And it hasn't. And it's so frustrating that it hasn't. 
you can be the feet that help to bring this out. Bring, put it in, post it in groups, post it in MS groups, forward this video, please, to other places and, and let's get some discussions on these parasites. All right, so in that video, you he shares pictures of these little filarial worms. They're mating, they're in clusters. I've done videos on that again. MS and flarial worms. There is a playlist on our Live Disease Free YouTube channel, MS and Infection. You can go there and you can look at the video about MS and flarial worms and you can see all the different pictures that he took of the little immature forms of the flarial worms and the eggs and the mating and clustering and having a great old time in our central nervous system. This is really, really huge. Forward that, that lecture to your healthcare professionals and not just neurologists to every single healthcare professional that would be willing to look at it. Please help us get the word out. All right. So let's go on to the third. So then the second one of the research is just realizing that these filarial worms are present in every MS patient that or any, any person that died that had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, it was easy to find. And so his work is really the first work that has revealed, that has discovered live parasites in the central nervous system of multiple sclerosis patients at the time that they died. That's huge. All right, so let's go on to the third piece. And this is multiple sclerosis um, and I'll go to the next slide actually let me just I have to just move something around here let's see hopefully it'll cooperate yes there we go okay so if we go to there we go that's the one I wanted to share with you okay so this is his most current research and I believe it was August of 2020 I believe so again he was looking at the autopsy, the central nervous system, cerebrospinal fluid of these patients that had died of MS. And he also discovered immature developing tapeworms in their spinal fluid and in their brain. So in the central nervous system of people that died of multiple sclerosis. So normally in animals, this is not super common, but when these little, like when the tapeworm, like if we have a if the animal would have a tapeworm in their digestive tract, sometimes the larva, the, the little babies, the developing tapeworm, they can make their way through our their gut and they can make their way through the bloodstream and cross the blood brain barrier and they end up in the central nervous system. And apparently this can happen in humans too. And so when they get into the central nervous system, normally researchers are finding that they stay small, they stay in their larval state, but they can, and they're usually in a sack, a really disgusting sack. And I actually watched a video on YouTube where a vet was operating on a sheep and cutting the brain open, pulling this little sack out and then closing up the brain and the animal could walk again normal by removing this sack. So the sack is a cluster of these very small developing larva. And they have not discovered the large tapeworm. They can be really big, depending on the type of tapeworm. They can be several feet long. But he, Dr. Alan McDonald, is the first person that has discovered a developing juvenile tapeworm. So not just the larva, but a developing tapeworm in the central nervous system of MS patients. Again, showing live living parasites in MS patients at the time that they died. This is huge. So we, I just really hope that somehow we can get the word out and we can, eventually he can get awarded for this because these are huge findings. So this is a poster of his research. And I just see if there was anything I wanted to add there. Let's see here. I think it's right here. And so this study, it describes the first uh, examination of the autopsy study, looking at brain autopsy in the ventricle, cerebrospinal fluids from confirmed MS patient and the larva. So it's called, 
uh, a soenurus, soenurus type parasite. So that is, that's where they find developing larval state tapeworms. And the tapeworm, they're the ugly ones that have the hooks. They have the round mouth with the hooks so they can see the actual developing hooklets and the mouths. It's just absolutely disgusting. So they were identified. I think that's it that I wanted to share. I just want to make sure I covered everything. So you can just imagine if we have filarial worms and if we have developing tapeworms in our central nervous system, it can be just brutal. And it is so important that we get this information out. It is so huge. I don't understand. I do understand why it's not gone public yet because there's no money in treating parasites. And if you look back on history of even Lyme disease, like back in 1911, if you look on our livediseasefree.com website under research, you'll see studies in 1911 that they were finding these spirochete bacteria like Borrelia from Lyme disease back then already. And so that it's not just one parasite that's causing the problem, but definitely par, uh, the tapeworms and the filarial worms are going to be a huge issue. So when I was first diagnosed with multiple sclerosis over 30 years ago, I learned early on about candida and fungus. So it was more candida than mold, but back in the day it was candida. And then probably about 10 to 12 years ago or more, we learned about Lyme disease being a problem with multiple sclerosis. But now, just in the last few years, we're really beginning to understand how parasites like worms play an important role in these, in causing MS. There we go, I'm back. So I just wanted to share a few common symptoms of parasites because some of you may think, well, I don't know if I have parasites because Parasites can cause such a diverse group of symptoms. So I just wanted to share, uh, number one, they can really impact our cognitive functions. So they can cause things like depression and severe anxiety by the chemicals that they produce. They can produce different types of amphetamines and morphine-like substances uh, that really impact our mood and our concentration, our ability to concentrate, having the foggy head, and there, remember, there's other microbes that can cause these problems too, but they're definitely the big problem. So also the weakness, the, the weakness in our limbs, the spasms, the spasticity, the stiffness, pain, of course, poor coordination, feeling like you're really unsteady when you're walking, tendency to stumble, loss of balance. And then for animals, it's like lying down and not being able to get up involuntary back and forth eye movement, blindness, difficulty swallowing, lesions in the central nervous system. See if you can relate to any of these things. Of course, loss of myelin. So these are all symptoms of, these are that I pulled together from different studies of, it's called cerebral spinal nematodiasis in animals. So when these little filarial worms get in the central nervous system of animals, these are all the symptoms that, that are showing up in the research from those animals. Weight loss, seizures, permanent neurological injuries, and inflammation of the mouth and curvature of the spine, scoliosis, impaired motor and sensory function of the lower extremities, head tilt, spastic gait, and there's a lot more on the other side here. I'll just share those with you also. Uh, chronic fatigue, chronic Okay, these are just symptoms of parasites. So these are just general symptoms of parasites. The first ones I shared with you are from filarial worms in the central nervous system of domestic animals. So now for just parasites, if we have parasites, so chronic fatigue, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea or vomiting, gas or constipation, bloating, distended belly, loose stools containing blood and mucus, rashes, itching, especially around the rectum, uh, stomach pain, tenderness, thinning of hair, night sweats, nightmares. <laughs> Maybe you notice on full moons that you are awake more often or you have like these crazy dreams. Migraine headaches, blurry vision, brain fog, mental behavioral problems, food allergies, sensitivities, dark circle under your eyes, and 
feeling unwell. And I'm sure that there were more. I know back pain is another one. I don't know if I mentioned that, but back pain is another really common symptom of parasites also. So there are so many symptoms that for years and years we had before we had our diagnosis and they were like little warning signs that we were out of balance, that we had too many of these parasites. And then there gets to be this tipping point where we have so many parasites that our immune system just cannot deal with them anymore. And then we step into this steep, like quickly or slowly decline in our health more quickly at that point. So awesome. You just joined the Academy. I'm so excited. Yay. I don't see what your name is, but I don't know if you're Allison or someone else. That is so cool. Okay, so I'm going to see if you guys have any questions just for a minute or so here. And if you appreciate that I'm digging up this research for you and helping you to know and understand what direction you need to go in order to treat this disease, the multiple sclerosis or whatever chronic disease you're dealing with and get on with your life like myself and the wellness champions have, please like and share and subscribe to our YouTube Live Disease Free so that you will know when we will be, I'll be sharing more of these trainings. Hi, Valerie. Hi, Janet. Hi, Maurice. I think you are Kevin. Wow, that is so cool. So I'm not sure if this is Kevin or not. I've been in through the Live Disease Free Plan for seven months and I've been able to access these, uh, to pass these parasites and I no longer need a, a wheelchair cane. That is so awesome. We need, I need to, I haven't ta chatted with you for a while. So I definitely, we need to talk. I'm so happy for you. And I believe that is Kevin way to go. So awesome. And that is what the, you, if you want to hear more stories from the wellness champions, then go to livediseasefree.com. You can hear it from their mouth, from their voices. You can also go to the Live Disease Free YouTube channel and we're putting, starting to put successes up there also. And it'll bring tears to your eyes. The most recent one we just put up was from Pam and she is 73, I think 73, I think so. I'm not gonna say any higher because we don't wanna go higher. But she's in her 70s with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. She's had MS for multiple years and she is such an inspiration because she shows us it's never too late to start. And she, when you listen to her, you're just going to cry because it's just so incredibly beautiful how far she's come, how her life has changed. And this is what the Live Disease Free Plan does. The Live Disease Free Plan helps you to treat the root cause of your symptoms. So we're not just a diet. We're not about just exercise and diet and supplements, those are all important. But the reason that we have these horrible symptoms is because of these parasites, these infections. And yes, we have to use a holistic approach. We have to do all the health promoting things, but we have to treat the cause. That is how you get out of a wheelchair. You are able to not use a walker or a cane. You're able to get rid of drop foot. You're able to walk again. You're able to have no more spasms, to have soft, supple muscles, to have your balance back. All of these things are possible when you treat the infections that are causing your symptoms and not focus on just diet and exercise and supplements. That is not going to be the cure, unfortunately. It's important, but it's not by itself. Thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. And so somebody's asking about parasites. Do you get them from leaving the country? No, parasites are present in every country. We are just told that we don't have parasites in developed countries, which is not true at all. If that were true, why do we have to deworm all of our pets, right? And our horses, our cats, our dogs, etc. They are everywhere. They are on our produce. They are in the dirt. They are coming from animals. They're just part of life. We become, yes, we should have municipally treated water where they treat the water to kill the parasites. But even sometimes when I've been living in cities that the municipally, the, the system breaks down for a day or two and then people are drinking raw water. It happens. So we are exposed to parasites. It is part of life. We have ignored parasites and that is why we have such an epidemic of chronic disease. They are causing 
the symptoms of autoimmune disease. So you do not have to travel out of the, out of the country. You can be living in any country in the world and you will be exposed to parasites. It's just part of life. And those of us that have been on a number of antibiotics, it doesn't have to be many, but especially for many of us like myself, it was before the age of 10, and also in my teens for acne, that really makes us more susceptible for the parasites to be able to take advantage of us and to be able to establish themselves in us better when we don't have our natural defense. So it's the overuse of antibiotics that really makes us more vulnerable to parasitic infestations. And Dr. Alan McDonald, through his research, through his accidental discovery, would say that MS is a parasitic infestation. And I would say that also. And a couple more here, and then we'll go. Uh, so your doctor found blastocysts. So I'm thinking it's blastocystis hominis, and I actually... The, my doctor found that too, and we treated it, and, and we didn't notice any difference. This was years and years ago. So I don't know if you if you would use antibiotics, but it just doesn't really seem to make a difference. So our students in the Live Disease-Free Plan, they're not really worried about stool tests because the stool tests are not showing the parasites that are causing the problem. Uh, you could probably do well with herbs with something like that. And Lyme, the thing with Lyme is that our students that have Lyme disease, they tested positive for Lyme, they always treat the bigger parasites first, otherwise they will never recover from the Lyme. You can see that the filarial worms can keep infecting us with Borrelia. That's just one case. We know very little about all of this. So yes, um, the blastocystis hominis will not be causing the MS. The treating the Lyme by it, your, on its own with antibiotics is going to not turn out well for you because people end up with more and more disability. The antibiotics just targeting uh, Lyme doesn't work long term. And then fungus, if you don't treat the bigger parasites, the worms and this, the protists and the bad bacteria, they're all producing a lot of debris and fungus loves, it's the recycler. So it's going to be present in higher amounts also. So in order to, to get the fungal overgrowth under control and also to get the the Lyme disease under control and the single cell protus, you've got to make sure that you treat the larger parasites first. All right, Magdalena, yay. Yes, you are. Magdalena just started. So Magdalena, that's so awesome. She just started the Live Disease Free Plan. So Victorious, you were told that the parasites only come from, okay, I got that one. Yes, it is Kevin. Kevin, we have to talk. I'm so happy for you. I didn't realize you were doing that well. I lose touch with a lot of my students because we've we've helped over, I always say it's over a thousand students in, we're in 15 countries now. So, so happy. So Rob, you just got checked for infection by your doctor. Everything came back clean. You don't get it. Their tests are not accurate. They're not picking up. I have had several stool tests done by my doctor because we don't have to pay for it in Canada and nothing has ever showed up except for that blast blastocystis hominis, which we treated years ago and it didn't make any difference. So this was all years before I've been developed the live disease free plan. And I didn't know about all these parasites and how to treat them properly. So Rob, it's not surprising. We just, our whole standard of care healthcare system has not focused on looking at like, could there be infections in the central nervous system? Our doctors don't have microscopes. They're not allowed to. They don't have access to the spinal fluid. And so what they're looking at is they're looking at immune markers in the spinal fluid. They're not looking for infection. They're like, oh, there's antibodies. There's inflammation in the central nervous system, right? There's lesions in the central nervous system. They're not looking for the infections because if they did, then they'd have to treat them and then they would not need all these expensive drugs, the MS drugs, which can cost one hundred dollars to $200,000 in a year. So Kelsey, personal success story. So altering your diet, you were diagnosed 14 years ago and fitness you have recovered. Oh, that is so awesome. That is so amazing, Kelsey. I'm so happy for you. So the key is to catch it early. And that's what I did too. I did diet, 
but for the vast majority of people, diet and exercise won't be enough to fully recover and to make sure we don't get future attacks, like we can recover from an attack, but we also have to make sure that we don't carry this burden of parasites inside of us. Otherwise, down the road, there are people that have five or 10 good years without an attack. So we do want to treat. And that is really returning our microbiome, the microbes that live in our body, trying to return them as close to normal as possible. We're living in an imperfect world. We're always going to be exposed to different good and bad microbes. So we need to be constantly just monitoring it and getting the bad down and the good microbes up. So Karen, same protocol to get rid of parasites, uh, brain worms and parasites. Yes, it's all the same protocol. It's just that some students that are in the live disease free plan, they might test well for different parasite drugs, but the parasite drugs are not a miracle on their own. So we're using parasite drugs, herbs and an oxidizing agent all together. And some students will test well for certain parasite drugs and others will test better for other parasite drugs. It's what you are exposed to. So different parasites can cause similar symptoms depending on where they're located in the body. Different parasites can cause similar neurological symptoms in the body. And that's the unfortunate thing because otherwise we could say everyone that has MS, you take these two parasite drugs and you're cured. And we see that even between PLS and MS and ALS and Parkinson's, that there is some common treatments that test well, and there are differences. And it's the same with one patient or student to another student with multiple sclerosis. There will be similarities and there will be differences as to which treatments test the best for them. And because we're not using stool tests because we don't have good stool tests, we're using energy testing. And diet is really, really important. And the bottom line with diet, I don't know, Kelsey, but the bottom line is low carb because all these bacteria, fungi, and parasites, they thrive on carbohydrates. So I'm going to stop there. There's more, there's a lot more comments. I thank you for your comments. Your comments will be answered. Our team will answer them. But what I wanted to share with you is if this is the first time that you've met me, and this makes, this is interesting to you, but it's like, wow, I need, to, I need to learn more. Go to livediseasefree.com to the, uh, to our website, but also to the YouTube channel, livediseasefree.com. No, Live Disease Free YouTube channel. And you can watch our videos there. And I have playlists on the different types of parasites that are involved in MS that we know of at this time. And then also I have a playlist of the diet and start to implement the diet and start to feel better before the holidays, right? Do this before the holidays. You will have such, you will have such a much greater time with your loved ones when you feel a lot better. And then you'll know how to get through the holidays and still enjoy yourself tremendously, but you'll enjoy yourself more because you have decreased the carbs. You're starting to have a lot of symptom improvements and you're not going to be suffering because if you eat the, if you feel horrible now, and then you go into the holidays and I am going to do a, before we break for the holidays, I am going to do a video on kind of what to eat and just some different ideas so that it can still be fun and tasty, but you'll get through the holidays. And instead of feeling worse, and instead of maybe even having an attack in January, because you ate all the wrong foods and you fed those parasites, and then they start to really cause problems for you you're going to hit the new year on a much better note, feeling a lot better. And then hopefully at some point, once you've researched this well enough, you will join us in the live disease free plan and you will have a game plan to treat these infections. So learn about the diet, learn about the infections. And when you're ready, when this makes sense to you, like Magdalena, she knows all about the parasites and she finally found us. And so she just joined and then you can join at any point in time. So if you're at that place where it's like, this makes sense. I, I need to, I need to watch your masterclass training. I need to connect with you, Pam, then do that. We will share the masterclass training. You need to watch that first. And then you can connect with me. We can have a chat. You can join the Academy, make sure it's a good fit for you. You can start right now. We have had new students just in the last couple of days, uh, three, right? Four right now that have just joined. And you can actually start the new year on a whole fresh slate where you are starting to just create health, 
take your life back, start to live your life, do the things you love to do that you haven't done in a long time. So we'll help you in wherever you're at right now, but the diet, make sure to start that because it will make such a great difference in how you feel and how you enjoy your holidays. All right. So with that, have an amazing week and I will talk to you next week. Take care. Bye-bye for now.